I'm Sarah Christman. And I'm Gabriel Christman. And we're the Victorian couple. Well, we really love the Victorian era because it was a very dynamic time, and also it was a time characterized by optimism. People had this idea that the world is getting better and better every day, and we can make it a better place, so we should. We also love the aesthetic of the Victorian era. I think a lot of people are attracted to the style, the design, and the technology. There were two things I wanted when I was a little girl. I wanted to live in the Victorian era, and I wanted to be a writer. When I grew up, I found a way to do a little bit of the time travel, kind of, and to let it help my writing. And so when I'm writing about things I do every day, it gives them a very firm reality. So I ended up working as a librarian, which ends up being perfect for us. I get to help connect people with things that they're interested in, and I particularly love to just encourage people to go further with their interests, as we are doing. We haven't missed any of the modern technologies that we've given up. Our house does have electricity. Electricity was something that was coming in in the 1880s and 90s. And it was here when we bought the house. Yes. And the light bulbs that we use are, are period light bulbs with carbon filaments and such and part of... And they're mostly for when we have company. Yes. One of the things that first drew us to the late Victorian period was the clothing. I think that interests a lot of people. So all of our clothes are copied from originals that we have. In the 19th century, people had different clothes for different activities, and so do we. I've always loved bikes. I've always loved the way that they've got you out into the world, the way they connected you to other people. The feeling is very different. Riding on an ordinary, you're high above the ground, you're about the, the same height as you would be sitting on a horse, and you get a great view and everyone sees you. The reason that we do all these things is to bring ourselves a little closer to the past, and one thing is that food is a way to really directly connect. Mm -hmm. Food is something that everyone understands and everyone can experience. But it's a very direct connection. The flavors and the smells and everything are something that you can directly experience. The old cooking utensils and the old cooking appliances are wonderful. I love using the wood stove because it's so easy to control, so much easier to control than an electric stove. I really love my rotary egg beater too because it's you can see exactly how it's working. It's mechanical, there's no mystery to it. It's no magic black box. I think a lot of people have something that they really want to do deep in their heart, but they don't because they're afraid of what everyone else will say. And so part of what we do is we try to set an example to people that Whatever your dreams are, they are possible, so you should go for them. Let's go, girl. You need the hookup. Come on, get it over with. I'm here till six. How do you catch fish? You gotta use good bait. The shoes, they could be tighter. You gotta tighten those up, bro. It's all about the bait. So that's what I call it, it's baiting. Now you could do better than that. I know. <laughs> it's bringing people aware of a condition to use my service. Sir, self-awareness, the first step is admitting. Young man. I started shining shoes around 1987. I've been at this corner for about 17 years. I used to work in this photo lab. Now we had a guy in there, he did something and got fired. And set up a shoe shop across the street from the office. So I went down to the corner to make fun of him, actually. Then he pulled out this wad of money and said, well, I already made more money than they pay me all week. I've been doing this ever since. Sir, sir, you gotta look down sometimes. A lot of people walk by and they're in their own little bubble. I tell jokes. Girlfriend, your hair looks fine, it's the boot. I'm looking for the dirtiest pair I could find. I'm not looking, I can tell a guy who just got his shoes done. Those who I'm looking for, the guys who, like this guy right here. Look at those brown shoes. The shoes formerly known as brown. They always ask me, 
how much money you made today. But I made about 900 bucks. It's honest living. I'm an average hardworking man who pays my rent and take care of my family. I ain't rich. I ain't never gonna have a million dollars in the bank. I love what I do because of the freedom. I don't have no incompetent boss giving me orders, right? I have no backstabbing coworkers trying to get brownie points. It's, I'm free. Give yourself a treat, get your ass in the seat. I wheel an 800 pound piano, a little more than half a mile just about uh, four times a week. I play in the park all year round. I play in the snow. I play when it's wet out. Everyone deserves to have a positive, powerful, emotional musical experience. There's no reason to deny that to anyone. I used to play for ballet classes. I was always looking for uh, a more fulfilling artistic experience. And while I was in the subway and walking through Manhattan, I always saw street performers. And so I wanted to uh, try my hand at street performing myself. One of the most integral parts of street performing is having a little bit of a spectacle. My roommate and I decided that bringing a real piano around would probably be the most unique thing to do. The way I push the piano is a strategy all in itself. I have to use a lot of brute force, but there's also a certain amount of leverage involved. I almost always have to keep my eye between the streets and what I'm going towards. Every now and again, there, there walks up that guy who, who, who says, boy, I bet you wish that you played the flute. Hey, do you need some help? No, I only got one more block, so it's all good. You, wanna, you can come there and listen to the music. I try my best to hear and see all of the emotions of the people around me. I'm thinking about the emotions in the piece that I'm playing, and I'm hearing them and feeling them myself, and I'm also looking at the people and thinking about how it's meaningful to them. that I do uh, for people. I had a piano technician and he would always tune the piano and then as soon as he was done tuning he would lay underneath the piano while I played to make sure it sounded just right and he would always exclaim how amazing it was and, and uh, I didn't think much of it and then one of the uh, fellows who often hangs out in the park was kind of having an emotional day and he loves the piece called Claire de Lune, and he asked if I would play it. Some friends of mine and I, we helped him get under there, and, and I played it for him, and when we brought him up, he had streaks of tears down his eyes, and it was clearly like, like a very, very emotional experience for him. And it made me think, you know, this is something that I should provide for everybody. I don't know, the music is, comes from, it goes through me. It's like you feel an energy of this place. Just to be encompassed with all the music and you feel it, the vibrations, it's so loud, you feel the vibrations, you're not even thinking about anything. You're just like... <sighs> There's a lot of confusion out there and there's a lot of negativity, and music is one of the ways that we go out into the maelstrom of all this craziness, and we lift everybody up. So my hope and dream is that I can just get better at this. My life's work, my passion, is ultimately to provide amazing musical experiences to as many people as I can before I die. Here we go, here we go. Focus. Everybody now with a selfie, with a phone, they're taking selfies of themselves, but they're not taking a real clear picture of themselves. 
and I could do that. New York City. I'm born and raised here. I use a 1940 speed graphic camera and people associate this camera with something old before most of them were born and to dress up to complement the camera is my style. And my photography reflects on what I do personality wise. How I interact with people. How I photograph them. How I listen to them. Try to get the feelings into my picture. Self-portraits, it's a selfie. Multi-exposure. This is called dragging the shutter. Slow shutter speed. It's a double exposure I did in Puerto Rico. Some of my 4x5 speed graphic collection. During the summer months, I start early in the morning, sometime in Harlem, sometime in Midtown. Packer film, FC 100. The thing about not able to shoot any more film, it's like going to bed and not waking up. The beauty of instant photography, you're able to see the image within a few minutes of taking the picture. Physical image, not electronic image. And most people in the digital age have not had a Polaroid or instant picture taken of themselves. That is awesome. So they're amazed at the fact that, oh, I could get this right now and see it. And that, that's quite exciting for me to see that all the time. Why do I take pictures every day? It's like, why do oceans? I give them one shot. The way I feel at that moment. And I hope that they like what I produce. That's why I do it. I'm Paul Brockman. I have the largest designer collection of dresses in the world. Whenever I seen a nice dress, I bought it because I never wanted my wife to wear a dress twice. The first dress that I brought home was a black taffeta dress with a gold color. That was the first one. And then it kept on going. And it went from one dress to another dress. So we had about 55,000 dresses. Okay, to, to be real honest, she is not that much into dresses than what I was. I didn't really know first what he was doing, and uh, every time I turned around, he had a new dress for me. When I went to a dance, I always looked for the gal that had the prettiest dress and those are the ones that I asked to dance with. I had a pretty nice dress on, according to him. It took a little while for me to get up enough nerve to go out and ask her to dance. So we danced all night. And we fell in love that night. I guess what you call love at first sight. We both liked to dance. He wanted me to have a nice dress when we would go out. My favorite dancer is the Vienna dance. When you dance at waltz, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a fast dance, and uh, when you turn around and you have a white skirt on, on the dress, it, it just flares out. That inspired me to start collecting dresses. And of course, you know, when you're in love, you're like a bat. You're blind. And I was. 
the main sources where I got the dresses was garage sales, estate sales, and I did have some relations with, uh, with some people from Sears. When our garage was filled up, uh, I said, we have to stop it. We cannot keep on going, and I won't be able to wear all the dresses in the first place. It was nice, but uh, everything has to come to an end. In 2014, I, I quit. That with the, selling the dresses came up entirely for my daughter. That she gave me the motive to sell the dresses. Even so, I had a hard time agreeing to it. But then I guess I finally decided that what is going to happen to them if I'm gone? We have sold up today around 7,000 dresses. The, the collection that I have, here, I have here at home, they are not for sale. And they're, they're going to be here until I hit the happy hunting grounds. The, the years have been fun. There have been also some headaches, but uh, hopefully we will find somebody who will buy the collection and uh, we can take the next step and they can use it and make somebody else happy. If these dresses are be worn, at least one more time, they're coming back to life. And hopefully that I could make other women happy with buying the dresses, that they've seen something that they could not find in the store and fall in love with it. You're jamming up traffic. They take it Who too long. You? Huh? Who are you? I'm the guy that's trying to keep you from getting a ticket from a real cop. When I got hit by a car back in 2014, um, I decided to sort of take the law into my own hands and just patrol the streets for myself to help the streets become safer. I don't get any compensation. I don't really see myself as a vigilante. I just see myself as a uh, citizen. I've never seen you with your mask off. <laughs> I call myself the mask maniac. Dress up like that. Because it, it intimidates everybody who thinks they're above the wall. I pull over cars for speeding. Can't be speeding down the street. You got. Are you the police? For double parking. These guys double park? Yeah. This isn't a parking spot. All things that would endanger either pedestrians or cyclists. It's a one way. Or a one lane street. I'm so sorry. I mean, you can hop in the car, move the car. All I'm asking you is to stop double parking. You're blocking up traffic. This is Africa. I'm waiting for somebody. I can't give out tickets. I've been assaulted. People have tried to tase me. I'm saying there's a parking space right there. Get the out of my face. Okay. If we come back and he hasn't moved, then what? Let the cops know. I usually lock plates. I'll sit down and talk to the police department when I run into them. I'm having a problem with this car being parked in front of this fire hydrant on this corner and jamming up traffic. I'm giving you a, a pass early before you speed by the cop or before you make that bad turn in front of a cop and you actually get a ticket. I get about four hours of sleep a night. My day starts at about 6 a.m. in the morning with prayer. I'm a practicing Sunni Muslim. I'm also a studio operations manager and I own a marketing company. Shoot straight down. Over the course of time, I've had a couple people come up to me about joining. I have now two other young men that work with me. We're going straight and we're gonna shoot up Crown. I used to see Sabir riding around town and I contacted him and begged him to let me join. Stay vigilant. If you gotta do a chase without me, do it. Sometimes I tell people that I'm a superhero. I grew up with my father being a police officer. He reminds me a lot of me before I became a cop. I had this kind of fearless approach to society and it was, I'm here to restore society and I really don't care who you are. I have lobbied him to be a police officer. So now what are you gonna do? And why not the police department? I have had issues with police officers in the past. I've been pulled over about 300 times because of the fact that I'm black and a cyclist. I can make more money not being in a police department. Especially well, we can get you in a different department. We can get you in a department that pays well. Good. You don't have to have a badge or a superpower to pull somebody over who's not abiding by the traffic laws. America needs uh, a leaders, right? that have perspectives on being black, white, Hispanic, Latino. And that's the kind of kid I think that we put out here. This sort of allows me to address the appropriate evils and negative situations in the world. What's going on? 
Have a good night. You're that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy. I don't know. It's really cool. Nice. What would you do? Nice. My dream is to have a chapter of the Mass Maniacs in every town in the United States. What's going on? Bring America back to that honest citizenship that we should have had a long time ago. Actually, you guys are doing a good job because, you know, every time you know, I come this way, uh -huh. the same thing over here. I'm trying to get to know why you're doing what you're doing, get you to understand where I'm coming from. If a light is green and the speed limit is 20, don't go 50. Because after you hit somebody, you can't understand where they're coming from if, if, if they're dead. मैं हेलो मेरा नाम सोमनलाल सेन मैं बाबा सेन हूँ मैं कॉस्पिक एनर्जी मसाज देता हूँ और हेडरेसर भी हूँ हीलिंग देता हूँ लोगों को बेड एनर्जी बिठाता हूँ मेरा सोमनलाल सेन बाबा मैं इंडिया राजस्थान पुष्कर का रहने वाला हूँ या लाखों लोगों को यहाँ से कॉस्मिक एनर्जी का आराम मिलता है उस जगह बैठे हो जहाँ हीलिंग होता है एनर्जी मिलती है पावर मिलता है पूरा वर्ल्ड आता है जर्मन फ्रांस यूएसए सब जगह से आते हैं आई हैव ट्रैवल्ड फ्रॉम लंदन टू गेट दिस मसाज एज पार्ट ऑफ माय ट्रिप आई सो वीडियोस ऑन यूट्यूब एंड आई वाज रेकमेंडेड बाय फ्रेंड टू कम ओपन आईज वेयर एनर्जी लिव अपना हो जाती है आप क्या सोच रहे थे उनसे बड़ा आराम मिलता है और टेंशन है थिंकिंग हो तो सब थिंकिंग दूर हो जाती है पर आराम मिलता है कहने का हमें फील होता है कि इसमें क्या है इसमें इसमें कितना पावर होता है क्या एनर्जी मिलती है इसको क्यों थिंकिंग कर रहा है ये क्या हो रहा है बॉडी में क्यों पेन है वो सब बातें होती हैं ये मेरी एक हंड्रेड ट्वेंटी आवर शॉप है और ये मेरे पिताजी की है जब मैं पंद्रह साल का दस पंद्रह दस साल का था आठ साल का था जब स्कूल स्कूल से दुकान पे आते थे पिताजी बोलते चलो घर दुकान की सफाई करो तो देखते देखते उनसे सीखा कॉस्मिक एनर्जी है क्या मेरे को आज पैंतीस साल हो गए इस कॉस्मिक एनर्जी को देते हुए पुराने पेंटिंग है उसको कुछ हटाना नहीं चाहता हूँ क्योंकि इसमें पावर है इस शॉप में मेरी में कॉस्मिक पावर है मैं 100 परसेंट अपने अपने आप को मानता हूँ कॉस्मिक एनर्जी जो जो शरीर की आराम नहीं मिलती है उस चीज़ को बाहर निकालता हूँ I'm in a different world and I'm feeling very strong positive energy and very alive right now. Um, definitely recommend this experience to anyone. वो मेरा एक बहुत बड़ा सपना है कि एक एक कॉस्मिक एक छोटा बाबा सेन का एक बहुत बड़ा अच्छा स्टूडियो हुए जिससे कि लोगों को आराम मिले तो ये मेरे एक सपना है My name is Martina Zavitz, and I'm a fat runner. A fat runner is someone who is fat and who runs. I run regardless of what my weight is because I love running. I'm breaking stereotypes about being fat and an athlete. You know, you're fat, you can't do this. I'm a marathoner. I can see the start line. Oh, In the media, when you see fat bodies being active, Come on out, Mary. It's always under the guise of a weight loss journey. Some people don't want to lose weight. For me and for the other fat runners out there that's in the community, 
we promote physical activity without the guys are losing weight. Being active doesn't have one size. You don't have to be 120 pounds to be a runner. You can have some size on you. Let's dig in. My reward for completing a long run is carrot cake. Mm. I have carrot cake once a week. I'm going to enjoy my carrot cake because I'm ready. This is some carrot cake. Somebody got me. I really need this. The fat running community is bigger than what you think. There's Facebook groups that has 15,000, 20,000 fat runners in the group. My average for a marathon is six and a half to seven hours. Ladies and gentlemen, the roads are now open. Over to the sidewalk. Thank you. Uh, I've had water stations taken away, finish lines taken down. They say that this is mile 25. I can't tell. The back of the pack is where I'm at. The roads are now open. Over to the sidewalk. Thank you. I ain't getting on no bus. For me, running didn't come to the mix until 2012. I had some hip pain. I found myself in a doctor's office, and the doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Evans, I know why you're in pain. Because you're fat. You need to start walking. You're going to die. And being sarcastic, I told him, I'm going to run a marathon. The doc laughed at me. Got on the treadmill, and I got up the next day, and I did it over and over again. I ran my first marathon in 2013. I had lost, like, almost 100 pounds. January 2014, I got into a pretty bad car accident. That car accident took me down for seven months. I got depressed. I wanted to kill myself. Everybody was like, look at Martinez, he's 300 pounds and running. And when I got in those car accidents, nobody was there. I was just another fat guy on the couch again. Started running again. A lot of family and friends, even followers, was like, hey man, you getting back on your weight loss journey? It got so annoying to hear people say, are you on this weight loss kick again? And it's like, no, I just want to run. So initially it was just me being spiteful to this doctor. But my goal is to promote awareness and body positivity. My message to the haters is go f yourself. <laughs> My sights are set for the Big Sur Marathon. It scares the crap out of me because I know it's a six hour cutoff and it's very strict. My fastest marathon is six hours and 45 minutes. I am nervous that I won't finish in time. Tough Mudder, it sucked. It's kind of terrifying. You got this, dude. Which one of y'all gonna get my big ass off the ground, though? Hunter McIntyre dragging my ass up the hills, literally pushing my ass. Come on! Tough Mudder was a mother. It was a beast. I did it. I'm a Tough Mudder. And now it's onward to Big Sur Marathon. I'm a little tired. I had to get up at 3 a.m. just to be here, but I also have a lot of energy. I'm ready to get started and I'm ready to conquer this race. The journey begins right now, right now. Ah! I'm in the back of the pack. It's hilly. This hill sucks. Jesus. 500 feet elevation. This is a pretty damn hard race. Uh, I know it's a six hour cutoff. They said something about being at mile 21 by 11.50. And we are far from mile 21. 600 feet ascent. I'm not looking forward to it. I'm a little worried about this cutoff. Water, 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 water. This hard as Oh my God. Oh, here comes the pain. Here comes the pain. <sighs> Unfortunately, I got picked up at mile 21. I did not make the cutoff. Course marshals pull up next to me. Says, we need to open this course up. We can take you to the finish line. And they made me get in. <laughs> For the past week or so, I wasn't able to run like I want to because I was sick. So I'm just going to let it go. Sometimes you're not going to cross the finish line. But guess what? I experienced Big Sur. I experienced that. Look at that. That is a win. You are experiencing life in spite of being fat.
Good for you, you're out there. Yes, I'm fat. I'ma let my man booze fly. And here's why. Fat is a descriptor. It's not a negative connotation. For me, it's a descriptor. I am fat, I have fat on my body, I have man boobs, but I'm also a runner. So for me, it's both. I am both fat and I'm a runner and I'm proud to be both. Wait, there's garbage over there, we've gotta go over there. It's great stuff, color. Isn't it a beautiful heap? I just love the way it looks all thrown together, almost like architecture. This has potential. That's pretty cool, huh? Recycled materials speak to me. It's like they say, give me a second life. They say, I'm here and I still have energy and vitality. Why? Throw me away. That's fabulous. Let's see if we can come up with something clever with this. I'm 73 years old and I've been working with sustainable and recycled materials for the last 50 years. So we're going to see if we can make some kind of a hat, cap, wrap. I've been making hats since about the late 60s. About five years ago, there was a roll of Viva brand paper towels sitting on the table, and it said, do me. And I touched it, and I realized it was very cloth-like. It wasn't textured. So I knew I would be able to manipulate it like cloth or yarn. So now I'm working primarily with the paper towels. Sometime I'll incorporate some packing materials, some egg crates, bits and pieces of metal, toilet paper roll, tubes, the cardboard. And then people send me things because they know I love to reinterpret them and add them to things. And so I've acquired the name of Gifted and Thrifted. A lot of my work has been at various museums all over the world. And on a lot of famous heads. <laughs> I'm joking, I don't know. My head, I don't know. Ari Seth Cohen said to me, well, it's time to do e-commerce. And I said, no, Ari, I'm just gonna do me-commerce. And I'm gonna walk down the streets in my hat and people are just gonna buy them off me. And that's often what happened. People I meet usually will come over to the apartment studio because they want to see the whole line. I 100% need one of these for Burning Man. And then you can even burn it because it's paper. And then we can burn it at the yeah. end. How much is this one? Three seventy-five. dollars right, it's good. The hats range from between $250 to $450 and people don't flinch because they go buy a little fedora on a wooden hat form for the same price. Go with some of the other things you make. Yes. The palette is perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Can I wear it out? Of course. Oh, Why you not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You so know, much. you own it. <laughs> my intention as an artist was to be able to live off my art. So you hope that your artwork sells, whether it's pieces on the wall or pieces on your body. My other philosophy is frugality is fun. And it is. And so, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to live off of what you make, but it's worked for me for 73 years, so. I help people with their problems because a lot of people sometimes they feel sad or they feel angry for particular reasons. Maybe um, they're in a relationship or maybe they're not getting along with their family or maybe just growing up and they're feeling nostalgic. He's had a, a very powerful moral scope since he was little. He had a passionate um, perspective about anything, especially when it had to do with like relationships or how people behave. He said, I, yeah, I can do that. I can help people. 
I'm here on Sunday. I can I be here from 12 to 2 or 2 to 4. Maybe it's not professional. Maybe other people can offer the same thing. But what matters is not a lot of people are doing this. He really listens to you and he really you know, looks at you. Um, also, he's not trying to make an answer that sounds appealing to you. He's trying to be very focused and very honest. Uh, I'm glad you're here because I really, I've been stressed out for the past month with the holidays. Why are you stressed? Well, aside from not knowing what to get for family members, I have an old, an old boyfriend coming to town to see me right during the holidays. I just don't know if I even want to see him. What will make you happier? Go, going and hanging out with someone or buying presents for people you love? He was super genuine. He had these like very honest eyes. Um, I mean, he's a kid. He's so beyond his years. Uh, the advice he gave me was very, like, from his heart. The most rewarding part is actually making an impact about how people feel about themselves and other things. Just seeing the stands may give them hope for something, made them feel better about themselves and maybe, like, the world in general. Change is going to happen because that's how life is. Life is always going to change and, you're, and people have just, just have to deal with it. You know, we always had these crazy visions when we were younger. I want to be a superhero. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be the president of the United States. Well, it just so happens that I wanted to be a merman. My name is Eric Ducharme. I'm also known as the Mer Tailor. A mer-tailor, cross between a tailor and a mermaid, somebody who creates custom-made mermaid tails. I will have been in business for eight years. But I'm always trying to create something that looks extremely realistic, something that looks like you just skinned a fish and put it on your body. We create silicone mermaid tails made from a dragon skin silicone. And they come in different colors, different sizes, shapes, and they're custom made to each client. Our silicone tails retail right now for around twenty-five to three thousand dollars. I made mermaid tails for Lady Gaga, Kate Walsh for advertising her, her perfume that she just came out with. Target, Nickelodeon. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. Mermaids have definitely become popular over the last couple of years. My name is Armando Esposito and I'm 46 years old. Well, probably just to rent a room in New York City, plus bills, must be something like 1500 per month, which I don't spend <laughs> because I live in the streets. <laughs> we all have to pay a price for the happiness that we're searching for. And uh, it's, we all have make different choices. I decided to live in the streets for four years with the goal of uh, having my retirement plan in properties. The biggest misconception about the homeless, which may not apply to my case, is that we don't do anything at all. And I am productive, I have a job, I have income, I pay taxes, uh, I swim, I hike, and when I don't have anything to do, I see films on Netflix. But when you see the homeless people, at least in New York, yes, you feel they're not doing anything at all. Some, they have a dog, so somebody has to feed the dog. How come they're homeless and they have a dog? <laughs> In the context of living as a homeless person, uh, I need to change the places where I stay, otherwise people will notice it and they're going to complain or call the police. So I live in the roof of a building, I live in a cemetery, I live in parks. So I'm just trying to find a place that is comfortable and discreet. In the seasons there are several elements. There's the heat, the snow, and the most challenging one is the rain. I have to dry everything after it rains. When it's too hot, I have to be aware of mosquitoes. And I cannot be in the sleeping bag because it's just too hot. And in the winter, when it snows, it's actually not a problem at all. I'm always warm and because it's dry, it doesn't affect my equipment. 
I am enrolled in a, in a gym that is near my job, near where I live, where I can sleep. Seventy percent of the food that I eat comes from the restaurants where I work, and the other thirty percent comes from the food that I buy in the supermarket and bottles of wine that I buy uh, for six dollars each bottle. Most of my friends are proud of the things that I'm achieving with the properties that I built in four years. But on the other hand, they're asking me when I'm going to start having a normal life, and that's a question that I have myself every day. Hay momentos en donde Dios da una respuesta para el problema que viene. It's very challenging to live as a homeless person, very difficult, I'm mostly stressed, but what makes me go over it is I am designing my next property, and I know that that helps me on the creative side, and it's helping me for my retirement plan. I wouldn't remind anybody to become a homeless person. What I would remind or suggest is you have to know which is the challenge you can take in your heart and your mind to achieve what you want. That's my suggestion. And sometimes people expect that life will provide you things. And I don't expect that to happen. I know that my work and my dedication will provide that one day, one day. And the name says it all. Desmond is amazing. The fabulous drag kid, Desmond is amazing. Desmond is amazing. I'm ready. I'm Desmond Napolis, also known as Desmond is Amazing. I'm 12 years old, and I'm amazing. So are you. A drag kid is a a kid who dresses in drag. Uh, I feel like the term drag queen is too adulty. So I wanted to change it to a different name, and we came up with Drag Kid. It's not bad. It's not like child abuse. Drag kids are just kids who are being themselves. The first time I started professionally doing drag was when I was in the Bacon Shake video for Jinx Monsoon, and it was fun. Uh -uh. I learned what was drag when I watched the first episode of RuPaul's Drag Race when I was two years old. Lizzie, what do you have on? I love the queen so much that I wanted to do it for myself, so I would take my mom's cardboard, paper, bubble wrap, my mom's old shoes. It looked fun, it looked creative, it looked awesome. I thought it was going to be a phase, honestly, but he still does it. <laughs> he still dresses up. Hey, he still steals my shoes. I dress in drag almost every day because it's fun. I get to do the makeup. It's just so fun, and I get to wear stuff like this amazing stuff like this. And now I put a pink lipstick on. And my routine is maybe be like foundation, concealer, powder, powder. <laughs> I like to put like 10 layers eyeshadow, 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 eyebrows, eyelashes, lipstick, blush, highlighter. Try not to wreck any of it. Put on my wig, get my outfit on, and that bath, Felicia. Nice drama, drama. Down a little bit more. Going to the Pride Parade since I was like four. Because I grew up with homosexual people in my family, I've always been a big ally of the LGBTQ community. So we would always be going to the Pride Parade. There were a lot of kids there that were looking up to him. You could just see their their eyes like light up as he went by that, oh my gosh, look, there he is, like there's Desmond and he's doing his thing. I have a full, full fan club, boys and girls. I think social media has had a big impact on kids understanding what drag is. All the drag kids can come together and just talk and like, like not feel like they're the only one in the whole entire world. I 
think the biggest misconception about drag for me is that people think that I'm transgender, which is not. I identify as gay. There's a large misconception that the only certain uh, types of people can do drag, that you have to be cis, you have to be male um, in order to do drag, which completely isn't true. Anyone can do drag. The message of, of House is Amazing is to really live your truth. It's incredible that they're, they're really trying to be a, a, a force to be reckoned with. Most people said, I'm wrong. Why are you doing this? This is what's wrong with America. The fact that he realized um, at such a young age like what he wants to do for the rest of his life, I, I really am proud of him for that. Like, I wish I realized that like six years ago. Mom, how's my lipstick? My number one role model is M-O-N, Mom. She's accepting me to this whole journey. Mom, just uh, let me be who I am. I haven't gotten nervous uh, for him until just like maybe the last year because we have been harassed, we have received death threats. I have a magic gate shield that just blocks all the haters. Like, boom, snap it out. To me, inside my deep pink rainbow gay heart with unicorns flying around it, Drag Kids is a bunch of like youngsters and teensters just like doing themselves. Remember, you're not the only one out there. And be yourself always mode. Anyone says I'm hate haters not mine, cause I'll never get as fierce as you and I. Yeah, I'm looking at you. My wife said I couldn't have a real live horse in Cranford. Didn't say anything about a mechanical horse. People around town call me the crazy Cranford cowboy because I ride around town with this motorized horse. Howdy! Originally from Cypress, Texas, and I've been up in New Jersey about 30 years. Back home in Texas, I had a successful Western-themed toy company and designed and developed and patented a lot of different products. I had problems with my back and my weight and they told me I needed a mobility scooter. So I wanted to construct something that better fit me, a horse. Built this, got a lot of odd looks. Never in my life. My father was telling me about this horse. He was like, you don't know this pony, it's on a motor horse. This is the horse he was telling me about. Unbelievable. He's called Charger because I had to plug him in and charge him up to operate. The horse is not technically street legal. It's categorized as a motorized wheelchair or scooter. It's an electric golf cart motor, four electric batteries, and it's a rear wheel chain drive tire in the back. It steers like an actual horse with the reins. If you want to go left, you literally pull the reins left. You pull your reins right, the wheels go right. And to stop, you let off the pedal, pull straight back on the reins to stop it like you would a real horse. Well, the horse is not my primary mode of transportation, but it's a lot of fun and a great way to get around. Can you go faster? This is it. I usually keep them around 15 to 18 miles an hour. With the governor off, it'll do 40 miles an hour. I've driven my horse through the drive-up teller window at the local bank to get my daily coffee. All right. To the 7-Eleven. People stop. Oh, thank you so much. Honk their horn. Oh. Take pictures. Yeehaw! Cowboy. Give me a thumbs up. I said to my sons, if this man passes away, make sure that you get it in his will that I get it. <laughs> the only negative side is I've had strangers literally find my house, come up and ring my doorbell at inappropriate times saying, can we get a picture with you and the horse? <laughs> I have a issue with his front left hoof. You guys have worked on my truck a couple times. I'm the guy with the electric horse. Yes, Steve, what's up? I have an issue with my front left tire. On the horse? Or on the horse. 
you want me to pop the hood? Yeah. Had a little problem with his uh, with his hoof. We were able to uh, put them all back together again and uh, get him back on the road. Thank you, Kurt. Anytime, sir. My ultimate goal with this horse is manufacturing and operating motor ponies all across the country. I'm a disabled vet, and I want them exclusively made by disabled veterans and persons with developmental disabilities, and try to give them the opportunity to have a job and even own their own small business around these horses. I can do a lot of corporate parties, state fairs, county fairs, rodeos. If I can make a difference in at least 10 of those people's lives and their families, it's a start. My name is Kimberly, I'm a professional snuggler, and I love what I do. So when a client comes to my home for a session, um, I always have them come through the side door because it leads right to the hallway, directly to my room. Once we're here, I tell them to get comfortable and just get in a snuggling position. I usually let them kind of lay down first or I'll sit on the bed and then let them see how they're feeling about it. And then once we started talking, getting to know each other, he gradually just kind of changed to different position, rolling over and things like that. When I first heard about cuddling, I think the first thing I thought was, where was this a couple of years ago when I was single and suffering from depression and just wanting to be, you know, held at night? As much as it's not sexual, it could be a turnoff. And, and so I try to avoid anything that might be um, a trigger. I have a boyfriend and people always ask, oh, how does your boyfriend feel about this? You're cuddling with strangers. And I say, um, I actually, feel like I love my boyfriend more because of it. The other night I came home and I was upset and I told my boyfriend, I was like, can you just hold me? I'll give you $80 an hour. <laughs> he started laughing. <laughs> in a way, it is my calling. I mean, it's, it's made for me in the sense that it's what I do naturally. If I see someone who's hurting or someone who needs compassion or affection, I'll definitely be there for them. I think what makes a great cuddler is willingness to just kind of focus on what you're doing at that moment and you know give it your all and for that moment be completely encompassed in making someone else comfortable. To us it's still shocking that in 2017 someone will say to us you're you're orthodox you're Jewish areas of a woman's body that are sensual and that, are, that, 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 that can stimulate a man basically and arouse a man should be concealed. The Frock is a women's clothing line it has now become a sisterhood of women who are looking for clothing where they can adhere to their le levels of modesty and be stylish at the same time. Oh yeah. To the average person, the stereotype of an Orthodox Jewish woman, and many modest dressing women, is that they're dowdy, unattractive, and frumpy. A, a skirt should cover the knees, be below the knees, or the, any dress or any blouse should be covering also till the elbow and the low neck. The neckline should be covered. For me, as a teenager growing up, I didn't have this like warm, fuzzy feeling towards dressing modestly. It was hard, it was challenging, it was something that I didn't want to do. It was so uncool to dress modest. I didn't want to be uncool, so how can we coolify being modest? Their dresses, I think they're amazing. I love them. I own probably a good four or five of them. They're, they're much more edgier than the normal things that we see around our community. It was always hard for me to like find cute clothing because of our modest restrictions. But then I find that that's what attracts everyone to them, that they're so fun and hip and exciting. So many see that as a move toward modernity, and it's a line that they say we shouldn't cross. I can't believe this woman in this community or these women are wearing this and promoting this and what's gonna happen to our children. Our daughters see this and like, what's the next thing, kind of, that was the reaction and the feeling. My advice to them would be, if they asked me, was, well, you don't have to cross lines, you don't have to necessarily be more uh, uh, controversial than necessary. We came along and said, no, you can fit in within a certain um, framework, 
but you can also look amazing. And, and be individual. And exactly. It's a real, it's like a, a raw nerve type of fabric. It touches the buttons. What started out as just like a small little business has now grown into a business where we are shipping to not only Jewish women in our community, to Jewish women all over the world. I, I love the idea that people are attempting to bridge the two worlds and to show that uh, traditional uh, Judaism is very much with the times, can be very cool, can be very hip, can be very fashionable and beautiful. We live in America, we live in the country that is governed by probably the most laws that you can and we're known as the land of the free. So to us having a guidelines and boundaries doesn't take away our freedom. I'm Rick, or Mortis Shrek. This is my wife, Kate. We live here in New Jersey, and sometimes people call us the Real Life Adams Family. Your home is supposed to be a place where you're comfortable, so we surround ourselves with things that make us feel comfortable. The biggest reaction we've ever had is probably, oh wow, there's so much stuff to look at. Amongst all of our goodies, I have a mummified goat's head. My wife has a bunch of marionette puppets, French focus dummies. I have a hundred plus Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. The real reason why I collect Ouija boards is I've been in pursuit of living in a haunted house. Is there anyone else besides David who would like to speak to us? People always say, Ouija board is a gateway. It's an opening into hell or the unknown or the afterlife. And I figured, you know what, if there's one out there that maybe is, I'm going to find it. So I started to collect as many as I could. And then I figured if I put them on every wall in my house, I could create a giant vortex into wherever it was. It still hasn't happened yet. <laughs> the reason why I think I might be into this stuff is because I was uh, running around a morgue at four years old. My grandfather used to babysit me in there and tell me, you know, Shh, people are sleeping. Our family car is a hearse. The hearse is our everyday car and we bring it to Walmart. There's some people who are really cool with it. They're like, hey, can I ride with you after school? And then there's others who are like trying to avoid eye contact. It's not a typical car, but it comfortably fits a family of five and has enough for the family coffin in the back. One time a woman said to me, she was like, you effing kidding me when I got out of my car. But other than that, it's become my most reliable car. I love the way it drives. It has a uh, Mustang 5.0 engine in it. This thing got some balls. We really do we just enjoy all the creepiness. Growing up, kids didn't really want to come by the house. They were pretty much creeped out. I don't really think my home is very unusual at all. You know, everybody in town, especially this town here, they go nuts on Halloween. And I just like it every day. John was born with Down syndrome. He had worn crazy socks his whole life. And he came to me and said, Dad, I want to go into business with you. We founded together John's Crazy Socks, an online social enterprise spreading happiness. And we do it through socks. And what will they find there? Socks, socks, and more socks. So we have over 1,900 different socks. We have a Sock of the Month Club. We have gift bags, gift boxes. We'd like to say that we're the world's largest sock store. I'm just call it sock because I wish you get a couple of John is our chief happiness officer. He's the face of the business, and he's really the inspiration. Start imprinting, bang! When we started, we had a little inventory. We were in a temporary office space in Huntington Village. The only marketing we did was to set up a Facebook page and have John talk about his socks. And we decided we wanted to make it really special. Got some candy, John wrote thank you notes, and we drove around and he hand delivered those to the door. Thank you. The customers really loved it and what they do. They took pictures with John, they took pictures of the socks, 
and started posting it on social media. And so word began to spread. And we knew this was something that could work. Last year was our first full year in business and we shipped over 42,000 orders. We brought in $1.7 million in revenue and we're gonna more than double that this year. We've been able to raise $100,000 for our charity partner. John made the world's first Down Syndrome awareness sock. He designed that. He's designed a Down Syndrome superhero sock. It's not enough to just sell stuff anymore. You've got to have a mission and you've got to be giving back. How come everything's named after you? <laughs> I can't. John says, Down Syndrome never holds me back. He's always finding new ways to get things done. John participates in all the major decisions, and when he's not here, the question is, what would John do? In schools, we tend to measure two things, analytical and verbal abilities. But there's an awful lot more to life than that. You know, his social skills are off the charts. His dedication to getting things done and paying attention. We focus on what people can do, not what they can't do. And it's part of our mission. So we hire folks with intellectual disabilities. We share what they can do all the time through social media and videos and content we make. We host school tours, we have school work groups. John and I go on speaking engagements. We want to show the world what's possible when you give someone a chance. President Bush wears your socks. Justin Trudeau wears your socks. Yeah. And should I tell them about Bob Dylan? Oh, boy. There's a rumor that Bob Dylan was wearing a pair of John's crazy socks when he picked up his Nobel Prize. Now, we started it, but he hasn't denied it. <laughs> We're using the steam from the boiled water to loosen up the gum so we can peel it from the bottom of the sneaker. And we put in here, we put some uh, hot water, some laundry detergent, and bleach. But this is just a quick solution to bleach your laces and keep your laces extra white. My business name is Fix My Kicks. It's a marketplace platform where sneaker artists can sell their service. People looking for the service of sneaker restoration, the services will now be centralized on Fix My Kicks. I grew up in Oakland. I grew up around a lot of drugs. Uh, my parents did their best to try to keep everything away from me. Um, but when you're living in poverty, like, it can just find a way back to you. And I had a lot of obstacles. I remember all my middle school friends saying like, James, you're gonna be a drug dealer one day. And I'm like, hell no, nah, I'll never do that. By high school, I'm selling drugs. There was a point in time where I was mentally preparing myself to be in the streets of Oakland for the rest of my life. Deconstructing that mindset was one of my biggest obstacles in itself. Since sophomore year, I finally had enough money to start spending on sneakers, and I bought a pair of Air Jordan Bread 4s. And I decided, all right, I'm about to do this myself. There's artists everywhere who have this valuable service, but right now they're all marketing through social media, Instagram, Facebook, and those platforms are not solely for the purpose of selling the service of sneaker restoration. There could be a better place to sell this service. And I was like, oh, that's where Fix My Kicks hit me. And the sneaker industry is a $16 billion industry. So that means there's money to be made for regular folks like us. Then I found out about Youth Impact Hub. They guided me as I went through the steps of what's my vision for Fix My Kicks? What, what's the actual problem I want to solve? And, and how do I want to solve that problem? So what do I see? Coming from a, a day of school getting bullied about your sneakers, the same people talking mess, the same girls, like, James, I see you, I see you. And it's like, 
Oh snap! I'm, <laughs> you know! It pains me that thinking about my whole educational experience, I was told that I wouldn't be successful. For that to be a regular norm for black men in high school in Oakland. And so for me, it's, it's so important that we learn that we can start a business. It's just dope to be coming up out the hood, not having food on my table, and to have sneakers be my vision of success. My name is Devin Person, and I'm a wizard. <coughs> I charge for my services when I see clients one-on-one. -on -one. When I'm on the subway, I don't charge anything. I don't want anything out of the interaction other than someone's time and their open mind. I try and go out as often as I can to, to Subway Wizard. A couple nights a week, a few hours on the weekend. Is this your first time meeting a wizard? Yes. When I grant someone a wish, what I generally promise them is a boon, which is that something good is gonna happen and open up doors of possibility for them. But in exchange, I often ask them for a task. Do you want me to grant a wish? I got a lollipop. If you got a lollipop. That's your wish? That's your wish? I like how reasonable that is. Could you do a task for me to help bring the positive energy into the universe and make this come true? How about cleaning your room for 10 minutes when you get home? Sound good? I became a wizard by doing a magic ritual, which paid off big when I got put on medication a month later that turned all my hair white. I'm 32, yeah. When you decide that you're gonna become a wizard, white hair is definitely a step in the right direction. When I go out subway wizarding, it's always fun to roll the dice and go out, and I know that just at that moment when I'm getting tired and I'm saying, let's pack it in, if I go for a little bit longer and ride a few more stops, something amazing's gonna happen. I get kind of addicted to that process of, never knowing who's gonna get on the train next. May I have a seat? Yeah, yeah, please do. So what's something in your life that you could just use a little bit of help on or make slightly better? Somebody I care about very much uh, broke her hip. She's 102 years old, she's my great aunt. Oh no. And just anything I could do, of course, to give her any peace. So let's go ahead and take a selfie. Do you got a phone? Yeah, for sure. So I think you can tell her this story and tell her that the wizard is doing everything he can on her behalf. I think everyone is the hero of their own story and they're going through their life and they're struggling with things that maybe their friends and family get to some extent, but it's the most personal to them. And when today of all days they walk onto a subway car and sit across from a wizard who wants to talk to them and offer them a little bit of assistance, that's a story they're going to be telling for the rest of their life. People have followed up with me where crazy coincidences happened after they had their wizard interaction. Hi! Hi! How are you guys? <laughs> I've always thought that there is more to the world than we understand. If you look at history, it's a long progression of us thinking we've just about got it solved and then realizing we have no idea what's going on. I think the world's a lot trickier than we give it credit for and magic's a way of having fun and meeting the world at its own mysterious level. People do think I'm odd because I don't fit the mold of a pastor. You think of a pastor as sort of a, a bookworm who's kind of feeble and fragile. I'm the opposite. I'm very physical. I love to test my strength to the very limits of human um, achievement. My name is Kevin Fast. I'm pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Coburg, Canada, and I'm one of the strongest men in the world. Currently, I hold around a dozen world records with Guinness. To date, I've pulled 15 cars all at once. I pulled a train, a plane, the house. I've arm wrestled a fire truck, the dump truck. I've lifted 22 people on my back. My limit in strength is unknown. <laughs> I grew up playing hockey and lacrosse, as most Canadians do, and uh, didn't know about these competitions that were going on around the world until I heard some guys talking in the gym uh, about these big, strong guys throwing stuff around in the field, and so I went down to the field to see what they were doing, and uh, ended up winning the event, so I thought, I better pursue this one. I was born in the church. My parents were of the Lutheran Christian faith. So it was just 
sort of a sense that I want to become a pastor and I've been at it now for 27 years and I've loved every minute of it. In church, I don't talk about my strength or the things I do. On the other hand, in the strength scene where I compete, people know I'm a pastor and they are always asking me questions and, and wanting help or my opinion on different things. So in the church, I'm just the pastor. In strength, I'm sort of the pastor there too. It doesn't hurt to have God on your side, so I, I tease him about that a little bit. I'm like, that's not fair, you got you know the big guy working for you, but there's no better. He's an icon. He trains for maybe like half an hour in the morning, and then he goes home, has some donuts, <laughs> takes a nap, but he's still like way stronger than anybody that I know. When I see a big aerial fire truck, and in fact my last record was three aerial fire trucks, when I look at them and walk the distance of them, it kind of scares me that this is just way too much. But I always have the attitude that this is a fight and I'm going to win. So I go past the physical pain and even go past the physical where there's no sensation left. I don't hear, I don't see, I don't feel. And so it's just the mind that's working at that point. The relationship between Kevin's occupation as a minister and uh, his feats of strength may seem strange, and, and to me they are, but there's a higher power working with him when he's pulling his trucks. You grow up thinking superheroes are real, then they're not real, and then you get to a stage where you do find people that are really out of the ordinary. If you put him among people with insane genetics, he would be insane even to them. My body got studied at the University of Southern California to figure out why I had such extraordinary strength. So they did a full body scan and uh, found out that my bones are all really thick and dense. My body has the ability to release adrenaline on command. All my muscles are recruited and fired in unison. Everything comes together. It's a perfect storm for strength. The way I look at my strength is it, it is somewhat extraordinary and I, I believe it was a gift given to me by God and I use it as long as I have the gift so I'm still going strong. Color is joy to me. You cannot be dressed as a rainbow and feel anything but happy. I am obsessed with rainbows. It's something that brings me a lot of joy so I incorporate it into most aspects of my life. The possibilities of rainbow are endless. I could think of a rainbow version of most things. It's taken over the most important parts of my life. <laughs> why make a choice of a color when you don't have to? That's why there's a rainbow, to have them all. Before starting to wear rainbows exclusively, I used to wear grays and charcoals and blacks and those kinds of things. There isn't another way to explain it except for that I was hiding. In my life, I've always struggled with weight and self-acceptance, right? self-love, appreciation of what I've been given. I kind of skirt the line between regular and plus size, so I never had enough confidence to wear what I wanted to wear and not care, you know, and uh, be as colorful as I have felt on the inside. And finally, a while ago, I just decided, let's do it. Let's just, life is short, I'm gonna wear color whenever I want, and that's it. So from morning to night, day, you know, work or personal life, I'm in color, always. <laughs> One day we took her from having standard issue brunette hair to having bright rainbow colored hair. We live in LA, the city of actors and facades, and so it's really cool to meet someone who lets her freak flag fly. I began creating my own textiles and sewing my own pieces because I couldn't get the rainbow exactly the way I wanted it. There are tons of murals around LA that are rainbow and colorful. So then it slowly grew into styling fashion outfits that I put together into the murals. It's really nice that my photographer is my husband because he's with me <laughs> all the time. So one thing we really bonded on was how cute it is to put a rainbow and clouds together. Connie's definitely the rainbow. I'm definitely the clouds. For like Connie's wardrobe taking over my little closets, it's fine. She can have everything. In our vows, I told her I would build her more shoe racks, so that's definitely something I'm gonna have to do. <laughs>
In my world, clouds are what you have to go through to get over things in your life, whatever you're going through, and then you make it to the rainbow and the color part. It's the concept of like moving through what could be bad to find the good. I never get sick of it. There's always another form or another version to create. I can envision my life in the future getting even more rainbow than it is now because it's addicting. I hope maybe someday I can drive around in a giant rainbow mobile. We're not there yet, but maybe soon. <laughs> if I wrote a children's book about myself, it would be probably a little girl who was shy and didn't know who she was or that she could be herself until she found the rainbow. And then she finds who she is and it's her happy ending. This is Star Trek, the original series set tour. It's a 13,000 square foot reproduction of the original soundstage that they shot the television show on. When you walk through these doors into this environment, you're aboard that vehicle of the future that you want to be a part of. I'm James Cauley. I'm the owner creator of the Star Trek set tour here in Ticonderoga, New York. We're doing our small part so that Star Trek can go another 50 years. It's a thrill, really, and kind of a kick to go back all those years. It is true to every detail. The attention to detail, he hasn't just done it, he's got it down to, like, you know, that yellow button goes there and the red one's there. And you look up at night at the stars and wish, I wish I was on the Enterprise, you know, and now you can be. explain how amazing it was. Oh, it, that was ecstasy, like walking through it. That, I was all smiles the entire time. All of Star Trek fandom owes James Cauley a huge debt. There's really no words to really communicate to you what it's like having your hero here in your home. Well, he's a distinguished, enormously powerful person in Ticonderoga. He rules uh, Ticonderoga. At least that's what he's told me. <laughs> It was like, here kid, here's a new car. You, know, you get these blueprints and I've now got the instructions to do something that I've always wanted to do. So we started building and then you find as technology improves, the episodes are, are brought back out in a higher definition. So now not only do you have the blueprints, but you can go to the episodes and you can pause and print. So you can start to see things that you could never see as a child on television. Everybody's lived with this for 50 years. So you gotta get it right. You want everything to make them believe that they're in the television show. So we go above and beyond. We research to try to find what antique was used, what type of vintage aircraft button was used. Is this for magical? I'm sitting in the chair. You'll remember this one day when you're 22. You're gonna say, there was this guy sitting in a chair remembering somehow. Star Trek has always been a, a very big passion. It really grew from you know, playing Star Trek as a kid, running around the neighborhood with your, your toy phasers and playing dress up. There's just something magical about turning on the television or going to the theater and seeing something that makes you forget about all the nonsense in the world today. Star Trek was very lovingly and masterfully done because it shows us this future where it doesn't matter what color you are, what size you are, who you sleep with, all that doesn't matter. You know, we're gonna get there together and it's gonna be great. Kirk to Enterprise, come in. My friends and I would get together and we would, you know, kind of make our own little Star Trek adventures here and um, share them on the internet with each other. And I began to realize that what I enjoyed the most about being here was not just Star Trek, but the people that would come to participate, you know, how much I enjoyed the friendships and the camaraderie. And my goal was how do I share this with more people? I don't want this to be convention. I want this to be an experience. I want this to be something they, they will take home forever. This is exactly what Star Trek's about. It's about people who are vastly different coming together through this thing and realizing how much better we all are because of it. I've seen awe and wonder and such joy that I've seen people weep when they walk in and they say to us, I never thought I would be able to do this. And that makes it all worthwhile.
it's always fun when people ask, what do you do for a living? And you say you're an artist, and they ask, well, what kind of art do you do? And I say, well, I make babies for a living. And they're like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? My name is Sarah Melman. I make reborn dolls. It's super important to make sure that the iris on one side is the same distance from the bottom of the eyelid as it is on the other side. Otherwise, it's extremely creepy to look at them. Reborn dolls look realistic as possible. The first doll that I saw just was baffling to me. It was so amazing and so realistic that I knew I had to give it a try. Everybody loves holding babies. Even people who are afraid to break them find joy in actually feeling them in their arms. It like makes you want to rock it like a real baby. Like pat it like a real baby or cuddle it. The beginning artist dolls usually sell the 175 to 200 range on average. And for the most experienced, advanced artists, they can sell for five, six, seven thousand. I've been making these dolls for a little over four years. Mine usually start around 750 and they go up from there. One of the oldest, earliest forms of collecting has always been dolls. There's just a, a huge range of people who collect them. We have everything from teenagers all the way up to old people. It's a learning process. My earliest babies, I'm sure, were far from cute. I've had one that I thought she was turning out brilliant and I put her in the oven to cook a layer and she melted in the oven and it was just so sad. I like to kind of study them for a little bit and kind of visualize what my brain thinks they should look like. I used to be able to make about three dolls a week, which turns out to be about a hundred-ish dolls a year. These are the veins and that just adds that much more depth to it. Nowadays I only make about 20 to 30 in a year and when the painting is all finished, hair is kind of like the last most important step. Actually, I just collected many ounces of hair off my own children. <laughs> it's kind of strange, huh? <laughs> they resemble the most pure form of, of love there is, a newborn infant or a small child. They just capture that moment of innocence. My nickname is Mofufu Wufafa, and it means if you take yourself too seriously, I probably won't take you that seriously. I live here in my treehouse in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, in the community called Chambalabamba. We're not really a hippie community. We're more of a new paradigm based on love being the bottom line. There's a very interesting group of people living in Vilcabamba that are foreigners. Foreigners who are a little bit offbeat. I became interested in living in a community, so I looked for land to start my own community. Chamba La Bamba is a mostly Latino artist eco community. We have about 12 adults and a lot of kids and a few babies, and we have a volunteer program. We have no rules, but we have only agreements. So nobody's doing anything they didn't agree to, and there's no authority here. When I was young, I was a hippie. Through my hippie days, D-A-Z-E, I found myself after a while. I was living in San Francisco and I wanted to leave a long time ago, but I had two children, so I stayed until they were well grown. One thing lucky for me was I bought my house and after 10 years, my house went up in value six times and I sold it and then I started thinking about what I want to do with my life now that I'm free from wage slavery. And I felt what I wanted was community. 
I was getting the community going with my finances, but then eventually the community would make enough money that I would just become a regular member at that point. We have lots of amenities already. We have three rental places, and what we want to do is have retreats here, because we're the perfect place for retreats. We're in the nature. We're growing tons of organic vegetables and fruits. The river, you can drink it. It's that clean. And we have medicinal plants in a, a medicinal garden. Well, we planted uh, lots of fruit trees. And we're walking down Banana Lane. Actually, it doesn't have a name, but I feel like it should be called Banana Lane. Because <laughs> we have lots of banana trees here. What's the name of this tree? Pitanga. This is Pitanga. Para mí ha sido un cambio maravilloso la experiencia de vivir aquí en Chambalabamba. Jovencito había pensado, sería chévere vivir con tus amigos, ¿no? Sort of a paradise, really, or something like that. It's hard to actually extract yourself and, and make that big step and go into a community. So people talk about it for years and then never do it. In order to come here and live here, you need to be a volunteer first. And then if they want to live in the community, we don't even have a vote. It's just when it feels right, then they're in the community. I would never go back to the United States because I prefer to stay right here where I am. It's just everything I want. I'm living my dreams. The bottom line of this community is love. We want to do everything out of love, not out of ego. So we're really exploring what it is to live in love, to be loved. And that's what separates us in a big way from the outside world. It's not like money is the bottom line. No, it's love. I'm Amazing Amy, eccentric yoga entertainer. At 63, I perform advanced yoga flexible feats that few can achieve at any age. My whole raison d'etre is to spread the yoga love to as many audiences as I can so that people of all ages can see an apparent little old lady who suddenly bust moves that are seemingly impossible for someone of my age. So I do this whole helpless little old lady act, and then I surprise the audience with what I can do if they freak out. I love it. And there's a euphoria and an ecstasy I get, especially in front of audiences, that doesn't happen anywhere else. It's the way I communicate with the world. I call myself a hyperlexic bibliophile. I just love books. I love strong female protagonists, and I like to think that I'm a strong female protagonist in my own life. When I was a teenager, ballet, jazz, and modern dance wasn't challenging enough. But I loved moving. So when I lucked on to Northern Shaolin martial arts, acrobatics, gymnastics, and yoga, that felt great, and that's what I stuck with. I lived in Taiwan from 1985 to 1987 so I could train in Northern Shaolin martial arts wushu and study Mandarin so I could create a martial art performance. And that was very satisfying until, of course, I injured myself but I never stopped the yoga. I came up with a yoga track to boldly stretch where a few seniors have stretched before. I created Yoga Yentas Yiddish Yoga Kosher Contortion. When people see my performances, it hopefully will inspire them because if a little old lady at 63 like me can do what I do, there are no excuses. Eso en mis manos, siempre yo estaba trabajando con mis pies, desde que empecé a usarlo, desde pequeño. Yo soy Ángel Marrero, este, soy de Puerto Rico, yo soy mecánico, mi familia, todo vean mecánica. Yo tenía en Puerto Rico dos míos, se llamaba Angel Mechanic Shop. Primero que estuve le puse el facilito. 
A toda la gente yo digo que esto es fácil. Puedo cambiar de bujía, puedo cambiar la goma, casi todo. Bueno, well, I need uh, my car to be repaired and he don't have arm and I will, I just smile like, in my mind is like, really? <laughs> and then he fits my car, he do a good job, awesome job. Lo más difícil, sacar una transmisión, pero la saco, yo no pienso en el dolor, me gusta hacerlo. Los cajos son un lado de esto para mí. Mi terapia son los cajos. You know what I see about him? Integrity. I see a motivator, an inspirer. I see a person who, who can help others. That's his gift that he got from God. So when I was little, he always um, used to drive me to school every morning. And um, he always picked me up after school. I never took a bus. Ese es el único que yo tengo. Todo. Growing up with a father that was disabled, um, there were some challenges that I had to step in, like taking, giving him a shower, sometimes giving him food. People misjudge him because he's not the same as us with two arms, and I just feel like that's not fair. You know, sometimes I just feel very sad that he's um being depressed. Bueno, cuando me tiré el agua pasó muchas cosas por la mente. Ya acabé con mi vida. Ya no voy a sufrir más. Ya no voy a dar por, ya no voy a molestar. Ya que te acabó. Llegó alguien y me rescató. En el momento no estuve contento, ya estoy un poco mejor, tengo un sitio donde estar ahora a vivir. Y voy a tener más oportunidad, poder trabajar, ayudar a otras personas que no tienen nada, que dicen que no pueden, y yo digo, yo puedo, porque no puedo, ustedes pueden también hacerlo. I'm a very proud son. I hope he actually gets his own body shop. He has a lot to give out to the world. When I saw him, he was in a cocoon. He was isolated from the world. Over time, he was like that butterfly in the cocoon. And suddenly I can see the, the wings. He doesn't have any arms, but boy, he can fly. my legs somebody gave me two hearts and all this energy i don't know what i would do with this energy if i had two legs and you know, i would be healthy probably i will like be a nightmare for everyone my name is dergin pakmak aka sticks and i'm an acrobat dancer on crutches and also on the wheelchair when I was eight months old, I was getting polio because I didn't get the vaccination. My left leg has a, has a brace on, which is going up to the hip. So it supports my leg, gives me the chance that I can walk on it. The right leg is good enough, so the bone structure is strong enough to hold my leg in, but the sum of muscles doesn't work. When I was a kid, it still didn't stop me. Other kids uh, could walk. I was starting to walk on my hands. And then when I was like six, when I was going to school, I was getting my first wheelchair, so I found out you can do also many tricks with them and play around with them. All the education, what I didn't have it on math or in history or in all those regular stuff in the school, I was putting in in more in sports. When I was hearing music, I was not able to really like sit quiet. I was like always like dancing with them. Hip hop came to Augsburg and there was a, a circle and I saw my cousin how he's going in and everybody was just like yelling and yeah and say what well, are you cool and then he came back he just gave me one push and I, I was like already inside in a circle <laughs> Breakdance was for me like a rehabilitation. 
founding the limits, how far you can go with your physics. Physically and mentally, it brings me together. body is just like a, a cube. What you put in this cube makes a form. I took advantage from my disadvantage. What makes special on that whole story is there's not many people that do this kind of dance style. So that's why I'm still able to do it as a guy 45 years old. If you have like a, a part of your body is like missing, you know, you're still coming and compensating. You don't have to be always from outside so super perfectly as the glossy paper magazine shows to you. What is, per what is perfection? For myself, I think I'm perfect. I perfect my dance, I perfect my life, I'm happy. You can be perfect in your own way. ये बी एम एक्स अमेरिकन बाइक है और इसके ऊपर मैं फोर्टी सेवन आसन और स्ट्रेचिंग और बैलेंस डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ करता हूँ मेरा नाम खीम राज गुर्जर है मैं जोधपुर निवासी हूँ और मेरी उम्र सत्तर के करीब है मैंने बचपन में योगा सीखा था जब मैं करीब बारह साल का था और उस वक्त मैंने ये साइकिल के भी थोड़ा स्टंट सीख रहा था तो उसमें खाली बैलेंस थे कुछ तो फिर धीरे 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 मैं करता 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 उसमें बैलेंस और दोनों योगा और मिक्स किया तो मिक्स करने के बाद में फिर मैंने बी से स्टार्ट किया तो अभी वो लंबे टाइम से मैं बी पे योगा कर रहा हूँ योगा एक 5000 साल हो गए हिंदुस्तान में चलते हुए तो मेरा ख्याल था कि ये फिट रहने के लिए सबसे अच्छी एक्सरसाइज है और बचपन में मैंने सीखा भी था अवार्ड का मुझे कभी काउंट नहीं किया मेरे पास सर्टिफिकेट बहुत है करीब सौ के करीब हो जाएंगे सर्टिफिकेट्स मेरे आठ वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड है और नौ लिम का रिकॉर्ड है और इंडिया बुक ऑफ रिकॉर्ड भी है बहुत से रिकॉर्ड है मेरे अल अल बुर्ज पे मेरी इच्छा है कि अगर वहाँ नहीं मिलेगा तो फिर अमेरिका में कोशिश करेंगे कि न्यूयॉर्क में कहीं ना कहो साइकिल चला सकते हैं उसमें स्टंट कर सकते हैं पर योग इसमें बहुत मुश्किल काम है मुझे लगता है ये ख़त्म हो जाएगा क्योंकि पीछे कोई करने वाला कोई नहीं है आते हैं कई लोग सीखने के लिए पर ऐसा लंबा कोई ठहरने वाला नहीं है हफ्ता दस दिन ठहरता है फिर चला जाता है तो लंबा पैसेंस चाहिए आदमी वो किसी में है नहीं इस इस टाइम पर तो मैं कोशिश कर रहा हूँ अभी नया कुछ करूँगा मैं तो मेरे दिमाग में सिर्फ वो पोज ही होता है और न मैं आगे पीछे कुछ सोचता ही नहीं सिर्फ कि ये पोज अच्छा होना चाहिए साइकिल बैलेंस भी होनी चाहिए बस और कुछ नहीं होता मैं उस वक्त कोई आवाज़ भी मारे तो मेरे को सुनाई नहीं देती दिमाग में यही है कि उसको टाइम से फिनिश करना और बैलेंस में रहना है दिमाग में वही होता है उसको कंप्लीट कर सकते हैं और उसमें कुछ नहीं सोचता आगे पीछे कुछ नहीं देखते इसी चीज़ होता है वो एक्सट्रीम लेवल पर चलता है तभी होती है I'm not trying to save the world. I'm not trying to take people off the streets. I'm just trying to give people a moment that they know that somebody loves them. And that's the reason I go out once a week and hand out a hundred dollar bill to somebody. A snack, anybody? What snack? I'm Dr. Moo Moo. I dress up in a costume. I'm handing out little Debbies to get people to smile. 
And then as I'm doing that, I'm watching for the person who may need some help. And I can hand out a hundred dollar bill to somebody. Is that real? It's real. It's for the two of you. Can you yes. 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 You're welcome. Reach your reach. Yes. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, God bless you. Oh, well, we're going to have a Merry Christmas. Can you use that little boost? Welcome. I know what it's like to not have anything. As a child, we were very, very poor. Happy Monday to you. Have a snack. Oh, well, God bless you. What a thank you. Daddy could afford 69 cents for a box of 12 Little Debbies. And so my sister and I, that was our treat. Little Debbie would always make me smile. Little Debbie sent this to me. The real Little Debbie. See, look. She signed it. Debbie McKee. As a child, it made me smile, so I think I can make other people smile with a little Debbie. Dear God, you know who needs a boost today. Direct me and guide me to them. Amen. It's special in that somebody that's just coming up off the street that does not know you and giving you a hundred dollar bill is a special moment. Financially, are you okay? Are you making all your bills? No. Can you use a boost? <laughs> yes. hundred dollars. Will that help you? That will help get some of these bills paid. Thank you. Thank you, man. You're welcome. Look up there and say thank you. Thank you, guys. Hi, nice man. <laughs> oh, I wonder what I'm saying to you. Are you happy? Yes, yes, I am. I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. My mother was mentally ill, and she was in and out of state mental hospitals all my life, and finally succumbed to it and killed herself when I was 11 years old. And then uh, about two years later, my dad married my stepmother, and she was abusive. One day, so I was like 14 years old, and my sister was 13. I looked at my sister, and I said, we don't have to live like this anymore. And then we just started walking, and pretty much bounced around from couch to couch. It always then made me aware of other people who are in my same position that are on the streets, that my heart goes out to them, because I know what it feels like to not have your own place to be homeless. Help. Homeless right now. You're homeless. Thank you. What are you gonna do with it? <laughs> I'm gonna use it for my son, actually. How old is he? He's seven. God wanted to bless you today. I wound up with a preacher who took me in and adopted me. And they're Pentecostal, which is very strict. And I always knew from the time I was little that I was attracted to guys, but I never really accepted that I was gay. So I got engaged to my girlfriend. And six months later, we got married. After I got married, I had like a voice tell me, you need to make a little costume, dress up, and go out and help people. When I say a voice, it's not a literal, they would go put on a costume. It's the voice in my heart. I had all these black and white cows everywhere, and so people just started saying, oh, you're Dr. Moomoo, you're the chiropractor, all these little puns, and it stuck. I did not charge my patients. I had a cookie jar that whatever they could afford, they dropped it in there. I would take out what I needed to pay the bills that day, and the rest of it I gave away. From 1983 to now, so it's like 36 years I've been doing this. I always kept dressing up as Dr. Moon a secret from everybody because that was something just personal to me that I was gonna take it to my grave. The only person who knew was my ex-wife. Oh, there's a homeless story. Did you read it? Within a year, I met Mark after getting divorced, and we've been together now, it's 26 years this month. It's a very loving, caring relationship. Dave was taking on his character of Dr. Mumu almost our entire time together, and I really just became aware of it about a year ago. It's kind of like they outed me. I come out of the closet being gay, I come out of the closet being Dr. Moomoo. I was in two closets my lifetime. It wasn't really shocking. It was all consistent with his compassion for other people. He could give money to a homeless organization or to a soup kitchen. Happy Monday to you. But the thing that gives him joy is just to have the experience of helping a person in a specific place and time. 
your life is back on track? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> good, good, good. Hi, how are you? It's okay. We're a submission. How many kids you have? Seven. What? <laughs> You're a busy girl. You're looking for a job? Yes. Oh, okay. Where you're headed to the job interview? To a uh, place where I go look up your interview. Can you use a little boost? It's right here. Yes. Can you That's use the this? Best thing. Can you use that little boost? Yes. Hi. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, God. <laughs> he did answer your prayer. Angel, what's your name? He said, I'll see you again. And I knew I would. And now, like, there's like a special connection. Don't you be crying on me, sister. <laughs> Don't you be crying. I know it was just for a moment we met, but it was valuable what you did for me. It helped me a lot. When Dr. Mumu gave me the $100, I was homeless. That money you gave me helped me get a new phone. And that helped me get the job that I have now. I love it. He said he prayed that day that he could bless someone. He's really like my angel to answer my prayers that day. You do not know how many times you're an angel to other people yourself. When I came home and told my daughter about Dr. Mumu, she's just so excited. She made him a gift. Boston made for you. Oh my God, look at the green and the orange. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, Look at this. I love it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I can take that costume anywhere and I will keep going. If it's in my control and I still got all my brains, I'm still going to keep going with Dr. Mumu and keep helping people. I had somebody that came over, all the, one of the older guys. He said that he doesn't feel very, very safe outside. And he asked me before if I'm willing to run a senior self-defense class for the community to come and have something, some place to train and to learn how to defend himself. All the seniors that came over here, they looked weak. They looked like uh, potential victims. We decided to run senior self-defense class to make them understand that they, sh they can do certain things even with their physical disabilities in order to defend themselves in case something happened. One of the reasons that I wanted to come to the um, self-defense class was that I myself have been held up in the past. Knee to the groin, one. If it's too far, the guy is talking, I cannot reach, I go with a full kick. Two kicks and I move forward, push away, and we teach over here Krav Maga. Krav Maga is a self-defense system that was developed for the Israeli military. It's not a martial art. Krav Maga is not a martial art. Krav Maga is a fighting system. We don't have any fancy move techniques that you have to learn and be extremely skilled. It's very, very simple things. Everything is straight to the point because when you're in the street, a lot of pressure. There is noise, it could be rainy, it could be dark, it could be a train, a police, a siren, different things happening outside. Keep it simple. You keep it simple, you stay safe. There's a big difference between a young guy that come and train than a senior citizen that come and train. The young guy is more dynamic. He can move more, he can do different things. When an older guy come over here, you have to make it a little more convenient for him to, to do the technique. We start the technique with a front trip against the wall. When you be pushed against the wall, somebody choke you, how to position your chin, how do you position your hands, then to put the hand on the center of the chest, slide it into the throat, palm strike to the face, grab the shoulder, knee to the groin, use your body momentum to push away and keep distance from the attacker. Stop, stop, hit the groin, hit the groin. Hit it on top, on top, on the head, on the head. Wait, draw me? <laughs> Very good, that's it, she's it. Every person that come over here, after one class, already feel more confident. I, I feel safer because I feel that I have some uh, abilities to, to fight back. Smash his face! Ah, 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 ah. I feel much safer now because I'm more aware of the potential of what I can do to protect myself. I think it's very important that would-be potential muggers know 
that if they try to bother the senior citizens, they may get more than they bargained for. I'm Deb Levesque. I'm a partner at Performix House, and I'm running the New York Marathon in a bear crawl. That's never happened before. It's never been done. I'm doing this for a cause for mental health. I want to bring awareness to suicide and show people that you can do things that you think are impossible. I've never done a marathon. I've never done a Spartan race. I've never done any competition outside of college football. When Devin first told me he was doing uh, the bear crawl for the New York City Marathon, I was taken back for a minute, but I mean, that's also Devin. He's just a ball of energy. A proper bear crawl is where you're on all fours, your back is straight and parallel to the floor, and you're actually going in a slow motion. If you put a glass of wine on your back, you don't want the glass of wine to fall. I think a bear crawl is one of the best exercises that you can do for full body. It's hitting your quads, it's really hitting your core, your shoulders, it's full body. I would say my training style is very animalistic. I try to not wear shoes when I train. I try to be on my hands as much as possible. I think that develops a different type of mentality with your brain. I want to be just as comfortable on all fours as I am on two. I don't think anyone has the exact only way to train. It's not like someone has a book that they found in a cave and they're the only person that has that knowledge. I've partnered with FitOps, which is an organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with their mental health through fitness. My whole mission with FitOps is to reduce veteran suicide down to the normal level of, of average citizens. When I talked to Matt about the FitOps, I started hearing more and more and about how veterans come back and they survive war, but they can't seem to survive at home. It immediately clicked in my brain that that's what happened to my father. He wasn't a veteran, but he went through that exact same thing. The New York Marathon has a high amount of visibility and I believe that Devin is going to bring a lot of eyes to the foundation and, and help people understand what our mission is. I'm bear crawling the New York Marathon to raise awareness and for my father who committed suicide when I was 16. My dad was the most like heroic, giving, loving person I've ever met. He was like that guy that would always go the extra mile for someone. He's just a super good dude. I started noticing his mental health when I was about 14. My parents were going through a divorce. It's just a stressful state and like I was watching the whole thing happen. It was constant crushing, crushing, crushing. And like, it, it's almost like he could never come up and take a breath. I just don't think anyone should have to go through that or have to watch someone go through that. When I was 16, I was at Driver's Ed and my friend's mom came and picked me up and he was supposed to pick me up. And I was like, where's my dad? And like, it took her like five minutes to tell me and she's like, your dad died. And I'm like, what? Like, what are you talking about? I found out later when I got to my house that he jumped in front of a truck on the highway. What would my dad say if he knew I was doing the marathon? He would probably walk beside me the whole time and like definitely push me and like train me for sure. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go. Good. I have an army of people helping me prepare for this. Acupuncture, training, cupping, sports massage therapy. I'm trying to constantly recover. I'm trying to constantly push my body more and more each week. Ah! Devin needs to build up enough arm and shoulder strength to endure 26 miles. So I'm trying to help come up with a sustainable way to build up his shoulders and his arms. It's really just how to program his training so that it's able to build, recover, and then build. It seems like when his shoulder's not strong enough, his wrist ends up taking too much weight. And when that happens, the skin gets taken off. Ooh, that's not good. This is burn cream. And then sometimes I put zinc cream on it, like hardens the calluses and like the cuts. In a perfect world, my hand turns into a paw. If the race gets canceled because of coronavirus, I'm still doing 26.2 miles on all fours on November 1st. Testing, testing. One, two, three, one, two, three. And this is a very rare opportunity. There is nowhere else on the planet that I'm aware of where one can legally climb into an old growth redwood tree. Name is Tim Kovar. I am a tree climbing instructor. I've been climbing trees professionally for about 26 years. 
There's no like, governing body of how to climb trees. You're an explorer in a new world. You're going to a place that most likely no human's ever been before. What did I get roped into? Number one. Remember that number? Number two. Three. All right, everyone looking good? First off, I want to thank you guys for coming out and literally hanging out with us today. <laughs> but we're going to use these to ascend. Once we get up there, we're going to switch over to a descender, which is this gold thing right here. Tree will be climbing. It's about 200 feet tall. I can assume that more people have summited Mount Everest and have summited an old growth redwood tree. Very unique, very special place where we're at right now. The location that we're at here it is a secret location, a private location. It's a tree that we're climbing into today. I mean, it's about a thousand year old coastal redwood tree. It's located on private property. A lot of the really big old growth trees, there's not many of them left. Like 3% of them are left actually on the planet. The ones that are left are protected in national parks. Getting into them, completely illegal, completely off limits because there are a lot of people trying to poach these trees. Wild or tame, you have to remind yourself that you know you are entering into someone else's home. Hmm. There's the acorn woodpeckers. Yeah, a little more than a little more than halfway up. <laughs> you okay with heights? Yeah. I'll be honest, terrified of heights. You know, if I'm up on a ladder or the rooftop, oh, I hate yeah, my knees just start kind of going. But I've learned over the years how to trust the equipment, mm -hmm. and I feel much safer 300 feet up on a rope than I do 10 feet up on a ladder. You know, people are shocked when they hear that I'm afraid of heights and what my profession is. You know, how do you put those two together? Climbing up 10 feet on a ladder or standing on a roof or on the edge of a cliff looking out and over, I get nauseous. The vertigo starts to kind of set in. When I first started climbing trees professionally, it was quite frightful. I kept going back, one, I love being in the trees. Perhaps it was tapping back into the childhood, the solitude I used to find up there and possibly seeing a bird or having people walk under me and not see me, you know, this little secretive ninja part of me too, you know. And then after taking other people up into the trees and seeing that thrill they were having as well, uh, it got me to the point where I got to really be able to articulate these fears to work with other people so I can teach from experience. And not only was it a redwood, but you were 180 <clears throat> feet of like looking out at the at the landscape, the coast is just amazing. The pure beauty. You don't think about bills and work and all that when you're in the tree. You're just you're just in an awesome tree. My vision and my driving force right now in life is to get people to reconnect with nature without preaching about it. And by giving them an experience like this, I don't have to preach about it. The tree does all the magic for me. Instructor, when he wants you to do something right, he makes sure that 
you do it right. One and a two and a three and a four. I'm getting bored. You know, sometimes it's hard, but it's it's what he does. It's who he is and I'm thankful because, I mean, I'll never forget, I was in second position and he kept talking about my big fat fat thighs and that's why they were that and this, that and the other. And he kept saying, push them back, push them back and was teaching me how to pull up differently. And all of a sudden my hips completely open in like this healing way, um, rather than forcing it. So you gotta kind of just like shave off what you're listening to and make choices. You know what I'm made? I'm amazed, I'm looking at y'all and I'm amazed that you cannot dance. I'm being very honest. I don't feel nothing. I feel nothing. Sometimes I say, I'm too honest. I hurt people feel it. But I'm in that corner. White kid will come in the, in the bus and they will well, you know, I got sick of going in the field, pulling radish, a couple of cabbage, and go to school. I to leave. They always tell me, go to New York. The, the black people and the white people is like one. I got up that path, I my on 34th Street. I said, Mom, where's my mama? to the class. I was the best for a week. I just love it. I just love, you know, with, with African people know better who I am. That was a good school. I was around interracial people. And that's what I wanted to be. I want to be in that, that gang. I like that gang. Those dancers are strong. Something you can dream about. It is so beautiful. It's, you feel everything you do, you feel it from the inside. you a perfect right, it will be right. You must know position. If your knee go over your big toe camp, you have trouble. Look front and do the step. When I saw what people were doing and how their bodies were and their technique was, I understood that this is a person that is really serious about prolonging and maintaining and sustaining one's body. And when I look at Ned and see how old he is, he practices what he preaches. I don't want my students to be where they can't walk. I don't want that. So I'll cut you up by that. I don't care. I'll cut you out. He is a stand-up um, and genuine person and maintains the legacy of something that is just culturally and historically important. I, I want him to keep teaching as long as he can keep teaching. It's, it's what's keeping him alive, it's what he loves. You know, and very, it's very hard in life to find what you love and to be able to continue to do it for a long period of time. So I, I hope he can keep doing it. I hope he can keep moving the Dunham Technique forward. Five, six, ten. Excuse me, I want the leg in the air. You can't do your thing now. Want that door open and close? I'm the king.
The first time that I came to the cemetery was about three years ago for a photo shoot, and now I'm here about once a week. Last year, I used cicadas. I've used deer skulls and antelope skulls. Bugs, um, there's just something that like is feminine, like having like soft, uh, the wings on it. I love bark. Um, the only downside of bark is sometimes there's still living things in it. So if you're afraid of spiders, don't use bark. But hair is one of the worst things to ever work with because I'm still finding hair around my house. Pulling a hair out of your crack that's like 24 inches long is one of the worst. <laughs> So this is Mika of Zola Jesus. She had requested a birch piece, which was really cool. This is Chelsea Wolf's Wooded Witch vibe. So at the cemetery, I got some moss and soil and made these nails. So far, I have designed for Chelsea Wolf, Emma Ruth Rundle. I did artwork for Converge, Caro of Oathbreaker, Wata of Boris. I've dressed everyone in Boris. There's two men in that band also. My pieces start around $300. Some of them can go up to $3,000. <laughs> About eight years ago, I was in a really bad place in my life. Kind of felt like everything was falling apart with my home life, personal life, work life. I moved back to Boston reached out to every designer I could find. And I, I don't know why no one replied, but literally no one replied. So it was a kind of like, you know what? Who cares? You have an opportunity to say you to these people. Like, do your own thing. I wish that I knew that getting involved in fashion was just, you can do your own thing anywhere. You don't have to just stick to a community. There's the rest of the world, and there's so many wonderful people out there willing to give you that opportunity. Grams is grams, no matter how you look at it. I could have never in a million years seen my brother go from selling crack in the streets to selling me cupcakes. Mm. My name is Antoine Gutierrez, also known as Chef Fresh. I'm the owner and executive pastry chef of Fresh Taste Bakery. And I went from cooking crack, I used to sell crack out of this house, to now cooking desserts. I used to use plastic wrap for my cocaine too. We call that transferable skills. You can order online or we deliver all five boroughs. At age 17, I mastered the art of cooking cocaine before I went away for attempted robbery and did three years in state prison. After that, I discovered a work training program called The Dough Fund, and that's when my life changed. I watched my first cake get made from scratch. There's a lot of similarities when it comes to cooking cocaine and baking. I'm using digital scales and weighing ounces and pounds of flour and baking soda. Like, I was just home again. Were you savvy with marketing? I learned marketing in the streets. Let's say you got different types of marijuana. Let's say you got a green kind, you might have a brown kind, right? You can sell them separately, but great marketing now would be, hey, let me take this green one, and then let me take this brown one. Maybe the brown one's a little bit cheaper than the green one, and I actually do 0.7 green, 0.7 brown, and call it beef and broccoli. Green and brown, that's beef and broccoli now. You know what I'm saying? My signature carrot cake cookies. Ooh. I'm famous for carrot cake cookies. They're quick turnover products. That's the hustler in me. I don't want to be working all day to make my money. They've all had carrot cakes and carrot cake cupcakes, but never the cookies. It's a cookie. It's like, where you gonna get that from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People go crazy for this stuff. Oh, f People be like, that cookie was good, and I don't even like carrot cake. So, boy. 
I feel like how macaroons is New York City's touristy cookie of choice. The carrot cake cookies could actually replace the macaroon bun. That was gonna be nuts. I grew up in a small town called Pisco, New York. These are the projects in Pisco. This is where I got my hustle on. It was a lot of heavy drug activity. In that apartment right there, I got caught with 12 grams of crack one time. I dove head first into the crack game. That's where I saw where the money was at. People used to have to walk through this lobby. I used to make my sales say, we used to break these cameras. I was totally misguided. You know how many times police ran up in this park trying to catch us? There's a lot of flashbacks. But I also get a sense of accomplishment too, knowing that I survived it. We used to sell crack together. The cupcakes are addictive, They're just like crack. I'm the guest speaker today. I give back by mentoring kids. I like to say Culinary VR saved my life, you know? I share my story. Unfortunately, I had to get locked up. I had to learn from that. I just showed them what success looks like from someone that had the same restrictions that was able to find a way out. I did have to work for five years in hotels and bakeries. That's how I got successful. I want to be a baker so badly. That's a good path. That's smart. Cheese. I'm like rocking New York City. God is elevating me with success. In a week, I probably sell about 500 cupcakes. These are $50 a dozen. Chef Fresh, Dr. oh my Jack goodness. Is. Not only are the cupcakes delicious, but he was in a rut and he turned it around. And I think a lot of that has to do and contribute to his success. Hey, Natalie. Oh my God. DJ Khaled's had my cupcake. Eva Marcel, some NFL guys. Got them cupcakes? Yes, sir, sir. Appreciate it, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I went to high school with Andre Rainey. I'm proud of you, brother. And I'm just happy to support you any way I can. Appreciate you, Joe. Never in a million years did I ever thought that I'd be walking around Pisco, selling cupcakes to my community. To be honest, it's kind of a sweet revenge for all the people that never thought I would come up. Wrist work, wrist work, Look at wrist this work, the wrist. wrist work. It's, it's natural. Calling every hustle. And that's fresh. <laughs> 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 I will find a dog, because there's a lot of lost dogs in the neighborhood. They were in a really bad shape. So in order for me to find homes for them, I had to create something that was colorful, as unique, to make them, you know, look appealing to other people, to be adoptable. My name is Miguel Rodriguez, and I am a pet couturier or pet fashion designer. I would not say pet for, I would call it for kids, because I don't have human kids, so those are my kids. Why not? We are at Dalila's Pet Grooming and Dalila's Pet Wear, based here in Jackson Heights. The front part of the store is the uh, boutique, and the back room is uh, where I groom the dogs and where the magic happens. By the way, this is Delila. This is my inspiration. I use the fashion to basically make consciousness of an animal that needs a home and I dress them up to basically find homes. They not just get room here and clean up, but they also get really nice dress and smell nice and also they get actually a photo shoot that will represent them, you know, to the new family. My cheapest dress is $14.99 and my most expensive is $1,200. I create a design basically focused and tailored to that animal. For the inspiration, I look at the human fashion that is coming up for the next season and I recreate that, but for animals. When I come here, I definitely feel like Miguel is a family for me. It's not like a simple other. A lot of the events that um, we t attend you know, they all give back to the dog community, and it's it's fashion for a cause. People that I had that had adopted the animals from me, they knew they could come to me and trust me that I was going to do the right thing for them. People who was dropping off dogs, you know, to the streets, they found in us a new opportunity to surrender the dogs in a safe way. Rescuing an animal and taking them to the vet is not cheap. 60% of our earnings, they get towards, towards the uh, animal rescue because they are part of the family. 
I have five dogs of my own. I have Venus, Dalila, Adonis, Dixie, and Ashley. A cat. Well, cats, I have quite a few more. I have 15 cats at the moment. All of them sleep with me. We all get to share the, the bed. And I'm the pillow, obviously. <laughs> Amun-Ra is a gentle soul with a fierce name. Who would like to dance with Amun-Ra? My name is Ananda Ray, and I created a form of dance called Shamanic Fusion Dance. The serpent energy allows your subconscious mind to connect with the serpent as a symbol of transformation, a symbol of healing, a symbol of your wild self because serpents can't be tamed. They're not a pet, they're a partner. They're here to guide us in this journey. When I was five, I was chased by a baby rattlesnake in my front yard. So if you had told me even five years ago that I would be here holding a snake and dancing with them, I would have thought you were nuts because there was no way I was ever going to touch a snake. It's really been life changing for me. A couple years ago, I started working with the serpent energy and, and it really allowed me to activate my sexuality on a really deep level and my, my sense of pleasure and connection to life. And what people say most to me is that they feel like they've done 10 years of therapy in one session. Wielding the elements of time, space, and energy to allow your body to communicate with you. So I spent my first year with Ananda at the once a month servant ceremonies. And I think I cried the whole first year just so grateful that I had found a group, a teacher, to really live my life fully. I've learned I don't have to be perfect. This is how I will grow and learn. I wasn't called to work with serpents. Um, I was called to work with Ananda. The serpents and the healing energy just came with that. She has been one of the most profound teachers of my life. You want to move her. And how does that feel, to hold this gift, to receive it, and to hear the messages? I had already gotten clean from a 22-year drug addiction. I was really desiring the next step, and then I lost my son. Well, the tricky thing about the serpents is I'm not sure how they work. I just know that they do work. I grew up with a medicine man, Cherokee, great-grandfather. He would teach me things like these rain dances. So I definitely feel like somehow through my ancestry there's been a lineage passed down. Many years later, when I retired as a choreographer and became interested in the full circle of coming back around to the world of yoga and spirituality and ritual and ceremony, my great-grandfather's spirit started talking to me. I grew up with serpents. My brother had serpents. My kids had serpents. I never owned my own serpent until I was much older. I had to do the math to figure out how many snakes I have. In the home here, I have 11. They eat up to 22 rats or mice a month. Absolutely, I love my snakes, yeah. We spend a lot of time here watching baby TV. We just stand around and watch the baby. That's why I can't get anything done. My life has gotten like much more difficult because <laughs> I would just want to watch baby TV all the time. Go baby, go. I always felt safe living here. I love growing up with animals. There was always plenty of animals around. I really don't know what I would do without them. They're so loving. <laughs> and then let him just crawl wherever he wants to, and the water will help him shed. I think my mom has always been really ahead of her times. And so people are coming into a time where they're more open to holistic thinking, holistic healing. I believe that if every person in the world were to try 
shamanic fusion dance in the serpent ceremony that we would be a different community, we'd be a different world.